Amen. It's fun to be with you guys today. Um, this particular day, we're talking, uh, we're still in our You Asked For It series, which means 55 of you submitted questions, and you asked us to preach on those questions. And so for the next 55 weeks, we'll be, pre- I'm, I'm kidding, we're not going to do that at all. Um, so we pick kind of the top ones that were asked the most often, and one of those questions was about the Holy Spirit. Easy topic for us today, right? No big deal at all. The Holy Spirit. So I've got some very pointed questions that came up in this one. So this is going to get very, very fun really quick. Here's some questions. If I get the Holy Spirit, will I have to speak in tongues? If I don't have spiritual gifts, does it mean I'm not going to heaven? If I don't speak in tongues, am I some kind of lower, immature, halfway kind of Christian. We're just going to go right after it. All right, now, these are big questions, and, and I, think, I think if I had to, I'd, I'd split us into two different kinds of, kind of audiences today when it comes to these questions, if I could. First, there's a group of you that are looking at these questions this morning, you're like, I don't even know what those questions mean. And like, if this has been a bit of a, a, a turf battle or a, or a controversy in the church in the past, like, I don't even know who the teams are. So like, get me to the next sermon, please. And that's okay. Like, you're going to learn a lot of really good stuff today. It's going to be worth it. But some of you, as soon as I put those up, you got tense, right? Like, you're in battle stance already because you've, you've been through this and, and, and you've heard churches battle over these things and, and you've seen the debate and maybe the debate, and this is the really important part, maybe the debate led to hurt for you. And, and here's the thing. In the church, we mean well, do we not? Can I get an amen? We mean well. But sometimes... Sometimes we hurt each other, and we don't mean to. Sometimes we confuse each other, and we, we don't mean to. And in this realm of the Holy Spirit, if I could just call out what I believe is a loving motivation, I think sometimes we as Christians, we, we want so much for another person in the church to have the same kind of powerful experience that we had. And sometimes we find ourselves pushing them in a direction, and sometimes we push so hard that without even meaning to, it becomes a little bit wrong, a little bit, I'm going to even use the word manipulative. And we need to do better in the church, amen? Amen. So we're going to go back to the Bible because that's where we hear God's answers and we see God's truth really, really clear. So we're going to do that today. Now let me just hit these questions just very, very uh, briefly, and then you're going to see them develop throughout the rest of the message. First off, if I get the Holy Spirit, will I have to speak in tongues? The short answer to that is no. No. Um, If you get the Holy Spirit, and we're going to see how the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you will not necessarily get the gift, and I'm going to call it a gift, of speaking in other languages. Um, And sometimes that's that's scary, and sometimes it feels weird to us. Amen? You can say, yeah, it feels weird to us sometimes. Um, that, That kind of stuff. But you are not guaranteed any specific gift if you have the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30 says, not all will get gifts of healing, not all will speak in tongues, not all will interpret. So it's up to the Holy Spirit to determine what kind of gifts you get. None of them will be guaranteed. Next, if I don't have spiritual gifts, does that mean I'm not going to heaven? So let's be really clear about this. The only thing that determines whether or not you spend eternity with God is if you've given your life to Jesus Christ. You have not morally earned it. You couldn't morally earn it. There's no religious steps. There's nothing that you could know. There's no love that you could love powerfully enough to earn your way back to God. Jesus had to die on the cross for you. And when he did that, he made it available that if you would come to him, even with a super clunky prayer like the thief on the cross prayed and just said, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So believe and give your life to Jesus and you'll be saved. Next one, if I don't speak in tongues, am I a halfway Christian? Absolutely not. Spiritual gifts in no way ever give you extra status in the kingdom of God. Okay, we'll keep that simple. So the Holy Spirit, let's, let's pull it back here and let's just talk about the Holy Spirit for a second. And I'm going to do a little Sunday school with you. The Holy Spirit is hard to understand quite often. 
And that's, that's part of the reason a lot of these questions come up is a lot of times the Holy Spirit has been branded poorly to us. The Holy Spirit is the weird part of the Trinity, amen? amen. Like it's, it's been tough for us. And, and, and this song was written by a band years ago and it's, it's just made sense to me. It's called Spirit Thing. It says it's not a family trait. It's nothing that I ate, amen? It didn't come from skating with holy rollers, it's an early warning sign. It keeps my life in line, but it's so hard to define. It's a spirit thing. It's a holy nudge. It's like a circuit charge in my brain. It's a spirit thing. He's here to guard my hard heart. He's just a little hard to explain. And you might notice I changed the pronouns there even at the end. That's one of the dysfunctions that we have even in the church is we talk about the Holy Spirit like he's some kind of a force or he's an it. That's not Star Wars. That's Star Wars. That's not Christianity, right? He's not a force. He's a person. He's a he. So, so Sunday School 101 on Holy Spirit here is we've got a trinity is the Godhead. So there's, there, are, there are three personalities. There's three persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're like, that doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't make sense to me either, really. I can try to explain it to you as best as I can, but I still struggle with it. And all the Christians said, amen, right? Like it's a struggle, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they're distinct from each other. They've got different pers, they are different persons, but they're one God. So when I look at Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Son is Jesus, right? Father is the Father, Holy Spirit is what we're talking about today. When I look at each one, they're equal in love for us. They're equal in their power. They're equal in their holiness. So don't rank them. They are three in one. And then Jesus, when he goes to describe the Trinity, one thing Jesus says is that they are so close, so tightly knit together, that when you interact with God, it's as if they are one God, just one God. And you'll hear Christians talk about that. Like, I just prayed to God, and they'll use the singular, and that's okay. Truthfully, theologically, technically, we're all talking about God wrong most of the time. And it's all right. One of the things that you're going to say in a minute is that the Holy Spirit translates our prayers for us because we need some translation. Amen? Let, let's talk about the Holy Spirit, some different things that he does. First off, John 14, verse 16, Jesus sent the Spirit to us permanently to be with us. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Let me pause you right there. Another advocate. Well, who was the first advocate before another advocate came along? The first advocate was Jesus, amen? So Jesus came to advocate for humanity. Jesus came to stand before God the Father and say, I love these people. I've died for these people. He advocates for us every single day. That's Jesus. And so when Jesus was about to go to the cross, he's about to die, he was about to go to heaven, you know, he ascended into heaven, he knew the disciples would struggle to not have their advocate fully there. Can you imagine three years living with Jesus and knowing him face to face? And then all of a sudden somebody tells you that Jesus isn't going to be there face to face with you anymore. Would you sort of freak out? I think I would sort of freak out. And Jesus says, it's okay, because another advocate is coming. That's how, how important the Spirit is, who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So the Holy Spirit's job is he's going to be the presence of God inside you and with you at all times. And he'll never leave you. Like, our religious experience with God, there are a lot of different aspects to it. You ever feel God? You ever feel God's presence? That's not just something weird Christians say. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit inside you. We're supposed to feel his presence, at least sometimes. And there's a lot of times I feel like I'm in a spiritual desert just like you do, and I don't feel like I feel anything. And I keep going forward anyway. And then the day comes when I, I feel his presence again. And that's the Holy Spirit inside you. Next verse is Romans 8 verse 9. 
And it shows that he lives in every Christian. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature, it says. You are controlled by the Holy Spirit if you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. And this last sentence is so important. Remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. So if you've been born again and you've been saved, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. That's what that verse says. Sometimes people might come up to you and say, yeah, I know you're a Christian, but you, do you have the Holy Spirit? You could answer them every time, yes, I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. That was a gift I got as soon as I got saved. Now, we're going to talk about fillings of the Spirit later on. Fillings of the Spirit are a little bit different, and we're not going to be ultra-technical about it, but I'm just telling you now, on some level, you've always got the Holy Spirit, and He's got ministry in your life, and you're going to see some of that. Next verse is Ephesians 1.13. His presence in you marks you as a Christian. This is big. It says, And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Do you see the phrasing there? It says, when the Holy Spirit came inside of you, it sealed you. What's, what's that idea? I was marked and I, would, I was sealed. Another verse calls it a down payment was made for me, for my salvation. What it means is that God has so united himself to my soul that I cannot lose it. Amen. That I cannot lose it. And that I am marked. Sometimes our Christianity feels like an invisible thing. But we're marked. It's a spiritual thing. But we're marked. And I'm going to go into like how you can know you've got the evidence of the Holy Spirit inside of you in a little bit. But you've got the Spirit in you and he marks you. Now, let me hit a real controversial topic in here for a second. One of the questions that we got during this You Asked For It series is, if I take the COVID-19 vaccine, is that the mark of the beast? Now, I'm not going to adequately answer this question because <laughs> it's too deep and it's too much. I also don't mean this question as a joke. It's very serious. And, and, and some of us... Are, are struggling with this. So I, I don't want to treat it lightly, but I do want to speak the truth. The book of Revelation talks about something called the mark of the beast. And it associates that with taking a mark that there's societal pressure to take. And so whenever there's societal pressure to do a particular thing for a Christian, sometimes we freak out a little bit and wonder if, if it's the mark. And that's real. Back when social security numbers first came out, there were a lot of Christians. They did not want to take a social security number because they felt like the government was kind of pressuring them to do so. And it's like, maybe that'll be the mark. And, 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 and sometimes our fear gets the best of us. The best thing I could say to you is read your Bible and read it thoroughly. Because this verse right here, it says that the, when the Holy Spirit comes inside you, you're marked as belonging to God. And you'll see it all throughout the book of Revelation. There's not just a mark of the beast. There's a mark of the lamb. And there's multiple times when you see people who are marked with the beast and people who are marked with the lamb. And why would God set up something where we could accidentally get this evil mark, but nobody accidentally gets the mark of Jesus? Right? It's a decision that you make. Remember we talked about boundaries a few weeks ago? God says, here's your property lines. You're the one who gets to decide what happens in your soul. And you either invite Jesus in or you don't. And if you've made that decision, you're marked with the Holy Spirit and you're sealed in him. And as far as God is concerned, you're marked. I, I know I didn't do it justice. I know there's a lot more there. We doing okay? All right. All right. Next one. John 16 verse 13 he will explain the words of Jesus to us. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he'll tell you what he has heard. He'll tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. See, the Holy Spirit's like a teacher to you. So it's not just you and a Bible at a coffee shop, right? Taking pictures of your Bible on Instagram, which is weird, by the way. Don't do that. 
It's not just you and your Bible. It's you and your Bible and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who describes to you what the Bible actually means. He explains the verses to you. It's part of the reason that we don't require you to have a seminary degree if you lead one of our life groups here at Grace Fellowship Church. Because what you actually need is a Bible and the Holy Spirit. And if you've got that, you can teach in this church. There's maybe a little bit more to it. But we trust the Holy Spirit in you. That's part of the body of Christ. That's part of the way that this works. You ever read the Bible and you find a particular passage a little bit hard to understand? And then you come to that passage like six months later or a year later and all of a sudden the light bulb goes on and it pops and all of a sudden you know. And you don't just know what it means. You know what it means in your life. It's like all of a sudden God made that verse on the page glow off the page for you because that's the thing you needed to hear today. You know what that is? That's the Spirit. That's his ministry in your life. And it's, it's part of the proof that you are a child of God and marked in him. Next one, Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. It says, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you of sin. Does this mean the knowledge of simple right and wrong? No, that's not what it means. Many of us know what's right and what's wrong. We don't have to be a Christian to know that. We grow up knowing that. We might know right and wrong, but we don't care. That's our sin nature. I don't care. Like, I might know right and wrong growing up, and, and maybe I want to do what's right, but at the end of the day, if you could really x-ray my soul and see what was going on, the reason I'm doing what's right is because I'm afraid to get caught in the consequences that might come. Or, I might want to do the right thing because I know that people who do the right thing tend to be respected and I'm worried about my reputation and I want to get ahead. And do you see how selfish I am? And sometimes there's somebody that I love and somebody that I want to get things from. And so I'll do right by them so that I'll get what I want from them. Do you see how lost we are? I mean, this is the human condition. So you might know right and wrong, yes, but you are not convicted. Because it's only the Holy Spirit that comes in and actually makes you care. See, I'm a pastor up here, and I I can show you the Bible, and I can preach at you till you're blue in the face, but I cannot make you care. I can't. I don't have that power. Only the Holy Spirit can come in and make you care. And there's a lot of people that finally get saved, and they finally have the born-again new birth experience, and they suddenly care about their actions. And I've had some of them come to me and be like, Pastor, I don't even know if I'm safe because I'm sinning so much. And it's like, do you know what you're doing? It's not that you're sinning so much. You were probably worse before. You just care about it now. And thank God you're sensitized to it. Because it's not just about a moral code of right and wrong. It's about whether or not you offend God. You love him now. That's what it's about. And when you feel that conviction that so many people don't feel, it's one of the top proofs that you are a Christian. And that the Holy Spirit has come inside of you. You're affirmed by his presence, by his power. Amen? Amen. Next, he translates our prayers, Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. What it's saying there is that you stink at prayer. You're terrible at it. Like, you don't even know what to pray for most of the time. And it's okay, right? You don't know what to pray for, number one. Like, he's got to twist your prayers into God's will. That's what it says right there, right? Like, you don't know what to pray for. Most of what you pray for is probably selfish. Um, Most of what you pray for is probably really disrespectful if we analyzed your words to an absolutely holy, majestic God. And it's okay. Most of your prayer life is probably really, really low faith as well. 
Remember how many times somebody would come up to Jesus and said, if you can, Jesus, can you do this? And he'd be like, if I can. How many times would he say that to us in prayer? But it's okay. We stink at prayer, but we've got the Holy Spirit, amen? Amen. And he translates every single thing that we say. I love how we get to see Linda up here in the corner every single week. Besides the fact that she's gorgeous. Besides that... It's awesome to see her translate words every single Sunday, is it not? It's like a stream goes to her and comes out as a different language. And that's powerful. And that's what the Holy Spirit does with your prayers. He's the interceder between you and the Father's throne. And all your prayers become perfect before they hit God. Doesn't that make you feel better? Gosh, I need that so much today. Next, he's very unpredictable. John 3, verse 8, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Jesus says he's like a wind. And you don't know. You just saw the leaves rustle. You don't know. You you can't predict the wind. You don't know where it's going to next. And you can't with the Spirit either. The Spirit is unpredictable. So much about this. We want a safe God, don't we? We want a predictable God. And this is annoying. If it's not annoyed you sufficiently, you haven't been walking with God long enough. It's annoying. Because we want to control God just like everything else in our life. And so what do we do? We, we try to put God in, in a box, right? Like, 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 everything I do for God, it's all about this moral code. It's all about this right and wrong. It's about what you can see of my moral life. And I'm working really hard on my moral life, trying to get my bad habits under control, trying to do good things, right? And I've got God in that box. What if that's not what he wants from you? What if he wants something different? See, my other box is like, I can make my entire Christianity about my Bible knowledge and about my theology. And I can Bible quiz you to death and I'll win. You know what I mean? And I will go, I know the verses. I know the theology and I can explain it. And some of you guys are that way. But that's your box and you've got God in that box. But don't ask me about my morality. And don't ask me about my faith. Definitely don't ask me about my marriage today. But I can can tell you about the verses. Right? I got him in this box. Another one might be social justice. Like I serve the poor and I volunteer over here and I give all this money away. But again, don't ask me about any of this other stuff because I've got God in this box. Because Why? Because this is the one where I'm comfortable. And this is the one where I feel like I, I can succeed and I'm in control. And I like that feeling of in control. But God is not a safe God. He's not a safe God. He's not a predictable God. You cannot control him. So what does that mean? That means he'll come into your life and he'll ask you to do the one thing you don't want to do. Right, like I've been here, I've been in this place, and I feel like things are pretty good, but the reality is you've not felt close to God in a long time. And the reality is you've not been growing in a long time. You've been stagnant, and so he's going to come, and he's going to say, how about this right here? How about you write this kind of check? How about you not be a church ninja anymore and get into a life group and experience the scariness of a brand new living room? What are they going to say? <laughs> like, I get it, right? What might he ask you to do? No, it's, you, you've tried this long enough. You're going you're gonna to go to counseling now. The spirit is going to come in like an unpredictable wind. And he's not going to be your safe God anymore. Because he wants you to grow. And he wants you to change. And that's the spirit. And some of it, so, some of his nature being that way is part of the reason that we've avoided him because he throws a wrench into our predictable faith. So I grew up in the church. I grew up in the church and I'm super thankful for my growing up years in the church. I was taught so much. I was taught the Bible. I was taught to respect the Bible. I was taught that, that God's people were good people and that I needed to be around them. Is, isn't that good? 
And I was taught about Jesus, and I was taught about the cross, and I was taught what it was to be saved, and I was taught that the gospel was good news, and I was taught a lot of really wonderful things. But at five years old, somehow the idea got to me that if I didn't pray a certain prayer, I was going to burn in hell for all eternity. And someone said, do you want to pray the prayer or burn in hell? Ah, easy decision. I'll pray a prayer. But I didn't understand and I got baptized, and I didn't understand. And it's nobody's fault. I just wasn't ready. But I grew up thinking I was saved. And, and, and my whole plan was all built on that one prayer, right? And then I went into the teenage years, and I kept attending church. But remember that whole piece about do you care about what's right and wrong? I didn't care. If you watched my behavior during the teen years, I did exactly what I wanted to do as long as I wasn't at church because I was still trying to protect my reputation there. I didn't actually care what God felt like at the end of the day regarding my behavior. So I did what I wanted to do, and it was proof that I was not a believer yet. I didn't realize it, though. And so I just kind of kept going, and it, it was 18 years old that the Holy Spirit came in and convicted me. And I realized what I had been doing. Not only was I not giving my life over to Jesus Christ the way that I had said, but I was saying that I was, and I was pretending that I was on the Jesus team, and I wasn't. And I felt deep conviction over it. I felt true fear, the fear of God over it. We're not supposed to live in fear, but the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, amen? amen. But perfect love drives out fear. I had to start at the first step, which was the fear of God. I had to know. And so I gave my life to Jesus Christ for real. And I asked him to take, take over the steering wheel of my life because that's the picture that was in my mind at the, at the time. And I said, and Jesus, don't screw it up, please. Don't screw it up. Because I didn't fully trust him yet, right? I, like, I had some growing to do. And I became radically saved. And I knew I knew that I had done nothing to earn my way with God. I knew that I had done everything wrong and that I had hurt people and that I stood before a holy God guilty. I knew it. Like, I don't know how I knew it. I just knew it. It was just, it was in me. And so when he forgave me, I knew I'd been given the greatest gift that there ever was. I knew it. Like, there's so much of this is like, I can't explain to you in a way that you'll understand. Either God's telling you or he's not. Either God's driving it home or he's not. But I can just tell you my experience. And man, it was a whole different world. Turned my life upside down. I devoured scripture. I had like a dumb little children's Bible back in my room. And I went and read, read the dumb children's Bible. Children's Bibles are great, by the way. I don't mean it like that. I just... <laughs> I just mean, I was a Christian music. I was just, I got to go to church. I got to be around friends. I've got to, just everything that I could. If God would have told me to go and be a missionary on a foreign field, I really didn't want to, but I would have done it because I owed him everything. It's like, have you had that? Because that's what it looks like. And so I had that experience, and I remember going through the first few years of that and just anything God would ask of me, and I wanted more of God. And I'd read about Abraham, and I'm not like, he's some old saint guy, and isn't it cool that he walks with God like that? No, I read Abraham, and I'm like, I want to walk with God like that. Why can't I have that? He talks to Abraham. Abraham does cool stuff. I want that. Do you have that desire for God? Do you have that hunger for more of him? And so I went, went a couple years after that, and I, like I said, following God and God, you know, ministry and, and all this stuff, and the Holy Spirit's there, okay? The Holy Spirit's in me, and I get baptized like four times because I kept doing it wrong, and I was trying to do it right, and thought God was like grading my performance in my baptism, which is really, really dumb. I can see that now, but it's like, but I was just trying, and some friends came along and said, Josh, you need the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, what do you mean? The Bible says I've got the Holy Spirit. And I was right. The Bible says I've got the Holy Spirit. I had him. But there was more. There was more. And so then they showed me this verse. And I'm going to show you this verse. Because this, this got me. 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, Pursue love, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And so this verse comes along and says, You know what? Sometimes there's more of God. Do you want it? 
Sometimes there's more. Sometimes there's gifts. Do you earnestly desire? Because we should long for God. We should long for every single aspect of him that we don't yet have. Because you know what you're doing when you long for him like that? You're emptying yourself of you and you're filling yourself with him. That's the way that process works. Earnestly, and, and see, I had no answer for this. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. What do you mean? Like I grew up without these things, right? Like these weren't real, really for us and all of that. And um, that's for somebody else. Maybe missionaries on a foreign field, maybe they need those spiritual gifts because they're like fighting demons. Like, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. But I didn't need it. No, earnestly desire the gifts. So it took me a while to get my heart really oriented around that and say, God, whatever it is, even if you make me weird, God. Because <laughs> there was like, I talked about those boxes before. There was like nothing worse than being a weird Christian in my mind. And I remember I went to my very first charismatic church and gosh, they proved every fear I ever had. <laughs> and it was weird. And I remember seeing people and seeing some of the things that they were doing, and I'm like, that's not God. That's, that's this person looking for attention. And sometimes it was. And sometimes it is. And sometimes it's not real. But sometimes it is real. And I remember somebody came, and they're like, we're going to pray for you. And they, like, they like grabbed my arm. This, this for real happened. And they, like, started shaking my arm. And they're like, do you feel the power of the Spirit? And I'm like, no, I just feel you shaking my arm. That's all I feel. <laughs> These are my stories, folks. This is what happened for real. So, so then, I, I'm, you know, so I have some experiences, and I'm like, maybe this isn't for real. Maybe this isn't what I need and stuff like that. And I get in this conversation with this guy named Jim Ranella, and Jim was this Bible teacher to me, and, and he was this spiritual leader, and he was awesome, and he was normal, okay? He was normal. And he starts asking me what's going on in my life. And I tell him a little bit about this little side charismatic thing that I'm looking into. And he's like, I have some of those gifts. You, Jim? No, not you. You're normal, dude. You don't fit, you don't fit that box I've got here. And he starts talking to me about it. And see, he wasn't someone who did want attention. And so he was cool with it being chill, Right? And so he starts talking to me, and, and I just start wrestling with God. It's like, if you've got this for Jim, maybe you've got this for me, and that God just really used that relationship. And I remember there was one night, and I asked Jim and some other people to meet with me and pray over me, and they, they laid hands on me. Ever have anybody lay hands on you? You're like, that sounds violent. It's not violent. It's a weird Christian phrase. Just people put their hand on your shoulder while they pray, and it's just this picture of community and authority, and it's wonderful. And it's, it's no big deal, but anyway, some people came in, and they just prayed for me, and they were the church over me, and they prayed that I would receive some gifts and the filling of the Spirit in a way I'd never felt before, and nothing happened that night, nothing, and I was super disappointed, figured I'd done it wrong, figured I'd done it wrong. I, I hadn't done anything wrong, it's just the Spirit blows where He will, and the wind does what it will. And we even got some questions after first service today saying, hey, um, I follow these parts of the Christian formula and these steps, and then this thing over here didn't happen. That thing about the wind again. It's, it's not about a series of steps. Some of you guys will get gifts as soon as you invite Jesus into your life. You see that in the scripture. Some of you wait a long time and you seek God for a long time. Sometimes it happens before water baptism. Sometimes it's after water baptism. The spirit is like a wind. And he doesn't fit your box. And it's okay. Don't judge yourself. It's not about judging yourself today when it comes to this stuff. So anyway, I think several months after that prayer time with Jim, I had another time where I asked some people to come and pray for me again in a different room. And as they prayed for me, something did happen that time. And God poured out some gifts on me. And I didn't really fully understand everything that was happening at the time. I'll tell you exactly what happened. I'm sitting there and they've got their hands on my shoulders and they're praying for me. I'm sitting in the middle of this room. And all of a sudden, and I never had this experience before, but words just kind of came in from the side over here, right? Like words just, it's like somebody was speaking words words to me and they weren't my words and I didn't create the words in my mind and that was a prophetic word and I'd never experienced it before 
but it was, it was God was giving it to me. And God started speaking to me, and I'll, I'll just tell you, he said, my son, why are you striving right now? You can't add anything to what's been done for you. He said, I did it all while I was dying for you. I want you to rest in your faith right now. And that's what he said. You know, and you're like freaking out. You're like, everybody, everybody, God just said this to me. And you're like, what did God do that night? Did he, did he fill me with the spirit? Did he fill me with spiritual gifts? Did he fill me with power? Did he fill me with love? All the above. He did all that because it's all in the person. When the person comes, the person comes. And you can't control it. I'd say it like this to you. Back to boundaries again. You got the property lines of your soul. You're the one who says who comes in and who doesn't. And when we reach out to Jesus, could I just say it like this? It's like you've made a vow to him. And you say, Jesus, you could have my whole life. And that's what we say. And that's good. But the truth is, you have not yet invited him into every room of your soul. It's the same thing with a, a groom and a, a bride. And they come and they make their vows, don't they? And it's great. And they say, in sickness and in health. Do they know what sickness and in health means? They don't. They're trying to. And it's good, and the vow means something. But it's not until he smells that bad, and he's in that bad of a mood, and he's that level of snotty, and you know what I mean? Go through all the things. It's not until it's that ugly that you really have to do in sickness and in health. And, and when you do that, it goes from vow to action. And it's like, this is your life with God. You've made your vow to Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit is going to come in and say, how about this room right here called your children? How about this room over here called your addiction? How about this room called finances over here? And he's going to take it one room at a time because he is a gentle, kind God. And every single time that he does that, you have a choice to be filled with more of God or not. And he wants all of you. And that's why it's a life. It's this Christian life. It's this Christian walk. Amen? Oh, there's so much. There's just so much. Um, Galatians 5.16. Here's the last thing I'm going to give you that the Holy Spirit does in your life. He makes you fall in love with God. Galatians 5.16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Um, it's just a different way of, of looking at this. One person wrote, they said, you know what, Pastor, during this, during this You Ask For It series, I'd like you to give us the deep stuff. I'll just tell you, this right here is the deepest thing you will hear all year, if you're willing. So what this verse says is that when you look at your Christian life and you think you've got a moral code and you think you need to work really, really hard for God, and the reason you're in a bad place with Jesus is because you haven't been working hard enough and you really need to step it up and work really, really hard for God. That's actually wrong. It's not the way that it works. What you really need to do is you need to fall in love with God. And when you fall in love with God, the actions will come from that. And that's the way the Christian life works. The Holy Spirit comes in and says, if you let me fill you, I'll make you fall in love with God. And when you fall in love with God, everything else will work out. I, when you were first in love, how'd that work? Did anybody say, you know, you really ought to hold her hand? <laughs> Heck no. You really ought to kiss her. I mean, if they had to tell you that, you were doing it wrong, amen? <laughs> like you were in love. 
And so it was like this burning fire in the, in the center of your soul. And all this wonderful stuff came out of it, didn't it? Poetry came out of it. Not good poetry, but poetry came out. You wanted to spend all the time you had with each other. Nobody had to say, how about quality time? Nobody had to say that to you. It just happened. You first had a kid and you looked down at that gorgeous child. No one said you ought to cuddle. No one said you ought to take uh, pictures, get your camera out more. No one had to teach you that. I remember our first son, Jacob, and crying in the middle of the night and couldn't be consoled in our little split-level house on Tanglewood Street. And, and I just hold him all night long while he cried at me, trying to let Linda have one night off so that she could sleep. Just dead tired the next day at work. Do you think I cared? No. I'm a son. I jump in front of a bus for him. I jump in front of a hundred buses for him. Why? Because I loved him. You know, somebody came and they asked Jesus, they said, what's the first and greatest commandment? Do you know what he said? He did not say, let me go back to the Ten Commandments. Let me give you a moral code. He said, no, love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. I want you to love. And the thing is, many of us have fallen out of love. We've fallen out of love with our spouse. We've fallen out of love with God. Now we're really getting into the deep waters. This world lies to you, tells you a lie. The lie is, if you fall in love with the right person, and if your love is real, it will never end. That's a lie. Your love will die. It always does. But because God is a resurrecting God, winter will turn into spring if you let it. And he wants to come and he'll want to resurrect your romance in your marriage. And he won't do it once. He'll resurrect the romance in your marriage countless times. Do you know how many times the love between Linda and I has died? That's hard to talk about, isn't it? It feels like maybe we did something wrong. Maybe we did. But we tell everybody that comes through our premarital class, we tell them the story of how our love died and how God came in and resurrected it because that's what he does. Because you know what's really underneath that lie? The lie that your love will never die? What's underneath that lie is fear and judgment because when your lie, love does die, you're gonna feel like I did it wrong and I bet this means it's over. It's not. God wants to resurrect. We always do this. We always drift. And so Jesus comes in and he says, you've forgotten your first love. He says that in Revelation to the church. Do you remember that? He says, you had a love. Remember how good it was. Go back and do the things that you used to do. He says that. It says in the book of Psalms, it says, just like a deer pants for a water brook, we should pant for God. We should long for God. Long for God? Yeah, long for God. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. You have a hunger for God. You're like, well, no, I don't. Thank you for being honest. Not, most of us in the room do not. But we can pray and we can ask the Holy Spirit to renew our hunger for God. If your marriage is broken down, you can come and you can pray today. That's all you have to do is say a prayer to God and say, God, would you as your gift to me, would you resurrect my romantic love for my spouse? Pray it every day. When it happened to Linda and I, I prayed that prayer every single day. Just prayed, asked God to resurrect it, and he resurrected it. He brought the feelings back. You prayed to God for feelings? Yes. It's exactly what you do. Oh God, fill me up with more of you. I, I want to actually want to read my Bible again. I got bored. I got busy. You let some things come into my life that were kind of dark and hurtful, and I got mad at you, Father. Ooh, I got mad at you, Father. 
And when I woke up in the morning, I didn't want to do that stuff anymore. And that anger, I couldn't speak it out loud, but it started to drive me. And here I am in this church service and I'm starting to remember, I'm starting to remember what it used to be like. And I want to be back there again. Do you want to be back there again? Now it's real. Would you guys stand? Let's pray about this. There was a spot in the book of Luke and Jesus says, if a son asks his parent for bread, will the parent give him a stone? Of course not. Of course not. And he says, even though you're not the best parents in the world, it's my modern translation, even though you're not the best parents in the world, you know how to give good gifts to your kids. So he said, so if you ask God for more of the Holy Spirit, of course he'll give it to you. And if you ask God today, God, help me to fall in love with you again. Of course he will. Let's pray. We've got heads bowed in here and eyes closed. And I'm just going gonna, gonna to ask you this question. And maybe you would just raise a hand. And you can raise it halfway if you want to. You just raise a hand and say, you know what? I need, some, I need some love resurrected in my marriage today. Yep. Go ahead and put a hand up. I need some love resurrected in my marriage today. How many of us? So many of us. How many would say, I need some, some love resurrected between me and God today? Yep. Almost all of us. Thank you for that. Let's pray. Lord God, you're the resurrecting God. We thank you that winter turns into spring. And that's your gift to us. Thank you, Lord. And God, I pray that the power of death would have no power over us today. And that we would not fear it. Because we would know the life and the power that's in you. So Holy Spirit, come in and fill us all the way. Renew. Give new life. We don't want to muscle through the Christian life anymore. We want the feelings back. We want you to renew our hearts, make us in love with you again. Don't care how many times I've got to repray this across my whole life, God, but I'll pray it today. Come and make me in love with you again. In Christ's name, amen.